Good afternoon, everyone. This is Krista King Oak, Youth Services Consultant with the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives. Welcome to today's webinar, Reading Between the Lines, How to Reach and Serve Tweens in Your Library, presented by Jill Frazier, Children's Librarian with the Kenton County Public Library in Erlanger. As a reminder, I will be watching the chat box and we'll be happy to take questions as they come up throughout today's webinar. Also, if you're having any technical difficulties, please let me know in the chat box and I will do my best to troubleshoot. There is also an audio wizard set up in the top portion of the screen. Slides of today's webinar will be available at the end of the show and recording will be available within one week of today's date. Without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Jill. All right, thanks, Krista. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Loud and clear. Perfect. All right, well, as she said, I'm a children's librarian at the Kenton County Public Library here in Northern Kentucky. Um, I've been doing this for about three years now, and it's been in the last year or two that I really started focusing on the tweens. I noticed we didn't do a whole lot for them at my system, and I really personally like that age group, so I started making a push to work with them, and it's, so far it's been pretty successful. So hopefully all of you will go away with at least something that you can use in your own library today. It looks like maybe about half of you do tween programming currently, or at least your system does. Um, and so maybe you can bring something new back to your system. So here is just a quick outline of topics that we're going to go over today. Um, slime, science, engineering, coding, book clubs, what to do, what not to do, crafts, things like that. Um, before we get started, um, I do want to mention what I view as the definition of a tween. For me, a lot of us hear, you know, different definitions, different things. I tend to focus mostly like broad range, like 9 to 14. I do a lot of things for 9 to 13 or 10 to 14, but I like to keep it narrowed a little bit. Um, you know, kids that are maybe a little bit too old for the early elementary stuff or the, the story times, the really simple stuff, but they maybe aren't quite old enough or mature enough to go to the teen programming or maybe they're okay with it, but the 16 and 17 year olds don't want to hang out with a bunch of 12 and 13 year olds. So we like to have things just for the specific age group and then you can market to them exactly. Um, I also want to note that you are, um, feel free to ask questions as they come up. If there's something that's not clear or if I haven't explained something well, just let me know and we will get started. So the first thing, I do so many slime programs. I don't know if you've done slime in your library. If you haven't, you should. Very popular. The kids love it. I thought it would maybe be a fad and that I would do it once or twice and then it would be over. Kids wouldn't still like it. Not true. I did a slime program just a couple weeks ago and still had like 30 kids come. So it's very, very popular. It is also very, very messy, so if you haven't done it, be prepared for that. We'll go over that in a couple of slides. Um, you can do all different types of slime. I didn't know this when I first got into it. Um, I just knew just the sort of the basics. It was just sort of like, I'm a 90s kid, so I was like, oh, it's like Gak from like Nickelodeon. Cool, whatever. Um, so I just knew like regular slime that you can make it colors. And then I dug into it more and was like, oh my gosh, no, there are like 10,000 different kinds of slime out there. Um, some different kinds that I have done are glow-in-the-dark slime. Uh, that didn't really work very well when I did it, but I always just tell the kids, this is science. We're experimenting. Let's see if it works. Let's see if it doesn't. Um, we can talk about maybe what would work better, what wouldn't. So then we're sort of even getting an education aspect in there with it. Um, when I did it, I used glow-in-the-dark paint. Um, I do have a link there to the website that I found my recipe on. Um, you can also use like glow-in-the-dark like powder filament stuff, but that was a lot more expensive, so I opted to not do that. 
It might have worked better. I'm honestly not sure. Ooh, a special mail with Chris's glittery slime. Got distracted by the chat box. Um, but, you know, it, it maybe doesn't work. I, you know, just told the kids, let's see if it happens. Glitter slime, of course, is also very popular. It's very popular among the girls, of course, but I tried to make sure to get a variety of colors because, we, well, we all know that boys and girls can like whatever colors they want, but I made sure to not just have, like, pink and purple because some of the tween boys, even if they like those colors, they're at that age where they have to look cool in front of their friends and can't do that. Um, the finer the glitter, the better because it blends in with the slime more. Um, so that is a little bit pricier. It doesn't quite go as far as the bigger glitter, but then it just, it feels weird. It doesn't always, like, work as well. Um, but if you want to do that, or, you know, you could do, make both types. If you have a smaller crowd, you could make one with each kind and see which kind the kids like better. Um, the slime program I did most recently was confetti slime, which was super fun. Um, you just do a basic white school glue slime recipe and then mix in like little mini like styrofoam beads that you would see in like a bean bag or something. Um, you can get multicolor ones. I found them on Amazon um, a lot. Just like a couple of bags went a long way. I had plenty for everyone. It looked really cool. It looked like um, like funfetti frosting and everyone really loved it and had a great time. Um, I did gold slime last year for the Olympics which I used gold liquid watercolor to put in. It was not the kind, a lot of us probably use liquid watercolor from like Discount School Supply. This was a special one, so it was like all gold, so it was like more of a paint kind of, um, but it looked really, really cool. Some kids added glitter to it. You could get all different colors though, so if you wanted to do a metallic slime, um, I recommend looking for something like that to add in to it um, to make it look really cool and like shiny and the kids really love that too. Magnetic slime is another one that I have done. Our teen librarian has done that here as well. Um, you use magnet powder for that and you add it in and your slime will be black, like super black. It might come off on like their hand. It will wash off, but it is, it looks like gooey. It looks like, I um, can't remember the Venom. It looks like Venom from, like, Spider-Man. He's all, like, black and gooey. It looks like that. Um, to get it to actually work, you ha you can't just use a kitchen magnet. You have to special order very, very strong magnets. Um, I found them on Amazon. You can just get, you know, a pack of, like, 20 or 30 and then order based on how many kids you think might come. Um, and that will make the slime be magnetic all around, which is really fun and cool. That one works really well. Um, like I said, it was messy, and I always tell the kids, especially with something like that, if they have younger siblings, to make sure to not let them get into it because if they eat it, like the magnetic slime, that would be very toxic to a child with the magnet powder in there. And San Sandra, I have not made the heat change slime, but I've seen it, so I might have to try it out because it looks really cool. Um, and then, of course, there's just regular slime, which is still always popular. Um, I use food coloring to make it different colors, and I give the kids options um, of what color they want. That way they can sort of personalize it. Um, kids have mixed the colors together to try and get, um, you know, a special color or something. More slime, because like I said, slime is a key. It's, uh, everyone that I know that does this with their tweens, they love it. It's super popular. Um, what I like to do, tips and tricks to make slime easier on you. I pre-measure everything. Yes, it's great to let the kids measure things on their own, of course, but when you have 30 to 40 tweens in a room, you're, it's going to get covered in glue anyways, and then if they're trying to measure it out, it's just going to be a nightmare. So I pre-measure it all. I put it in bowls and little like bathroom plastic cups for my materials. I cover my tables in plastic tablecloths. So then at the end, I can just fold everything up. I let them leave their empty bowls and spoons and cups and everything on the table, and then I can just throw it all away because it's going to be gross and covered in glue and slime, and you won't want to keep it. If you have never made slime before, make sure to practice. You're going to need to know what you're doing, and you're going to need to be able to give the kids instructions multiple times. 
I will tell them a thousand different times what to do, and they still don't listen, and we'll mess it up. Then you have to try and help them and go over the instructions with them. Um, you know, there's little tips and tricks. You know, you can figure out your ratios just right. I found recipes, but if you're adding things in, especially like liquids, that can affect the consistency, so then you might have to play around with it more. Um, it will be a big, big mess, like I said. So if your room that you use has carpet in it, I would maybe not recommend doing slime or put something on the floor or just really, really, really let your kids know that they cannot get it on the floor because it will be very hard to get out. Um, and then with troubleshooting, I have a lot of kids that come who make slime at home all the time or have just come to my programs every time I do it who have become experts in and of themselves. And so I'll sometimes have the kids help each other out. If I know there's you know, a child attending who is really good at making slime and there's like seven kids struggling, I'll be like, hey, can you go help them out and I'm going to help them and we can help them get their slime good. They're really, really great about doing that and it gets them some good interactions with each other and um, you know, it's just really good for everyone. What I like to use is Elmer's white or clear glue. I personally have found that the Elmer's name brand does work the best but any just like school glue will do, um, especially if you're just doing basic white glue. Um, and then I like to use liquid starch from my activator, but you can use different things um, to activate it. And the activator is what you add into the glue to turn it into slime. And you can use borax contact solution. I think you can use baking soda. There's lots of different things. Um, but like I said, I prefer liquid starch. And then I always give them plastic bowls with the glue in it, um, spoons or craft sticks to help a Ziploc bag to take their slime home in because otherwise the parents are not very happy. And then if I add anything in, I just get little like medicine or condiment cups off Amazon or from the grocery store. But I'll put, I'll pre-measure out even like the glitter, foam beads, um, liquids, things like that. Um, the only things I don't pre-measure are if we're adding food coloring because it's just a few drops anyways. So I'll go around and add it in or let the kids do that part themselves. So I know that's a lot on slime, but we still have one more page. <laughs> um, Google. Google is your friend. I found a lot of my recipes just by doing searches online. I'm sure we've all seen some of this stuff on Pinterest and things like that. Um, but, you know, go out there, search, see what's out there. There's some really, really cool things people have done. Um, I listed here on the um, slide the recipe that I use. And then we actually had a book come in one day called Ultimate Slime by Alyssa Jagan, I believe. I use this a lot. I actually had my system order a second copy of it, so that way I could have one that's professional that I can have at my use anytime. Um, that's where I found the confetti slime. They do um, like fluffy slime and things like that, and it's, it's a really good resource. They go over some troubleshooting, give me some great ideas I can tweak on my own. So if you have that in your collection, I recommend looking at it um, or maybe seeing if you could order it for your system because I have found it to be extremely helpful. To get out of slime but still in the science realm, science. Science programs are very popular, um, especially if you make it fun. Kids are naturally interested in this stuff anyways. Um, some science type programs I've done are ice cream in a bag. I said here at the very top, it will be messy, of course. Almost all of my tween programs are extremely messy, so if you are not a big fan of mess, it might not be for you, or you might just have to learn how to deal with it the best way you can, because this age group is messy. They love to get messy. It's super fun. Um, I have a link there to the recipe that I use. I, once again, pre-measured most of my stuff. Um, one thing that was sort of a fail on this program when I did it last summer um, was that the Ziploc bags we put it in, like, they didn't leak too bad, but because you put salt on the ice to make the ice cream, you, like, put the liquid in a bag and then put that bag in a bag with ice and salt and shake it up, the ice cream and they were eating it was kind of salty. Um, part of that's also because we transferred it into bowls. So I'm, I'm trying it again this summer, and I'm going to try to just dry off the bag with the ice cream in it and have them eat it out of the bag to try and combat that. Um, the kids liked it anyways. They still ate it. I gave them, um, like, toppings, like chocolate sauce and caramel and sprinkles and cherries and things to add on. So they were still happy. They were eating ice cream they'd made themselves. 
so it was still super fun. Um, but I'm going to try and tweak it to try and not have that happen this year. Um, but that one was really fun. The kids loved it. The parents really liked it. It's something that they can do at home as well, which is a big thing I tell parents. Like, if you don't want to deal with the mess, that's fine. But pretty much everything we do are things you can do at home. Oh, perfect, Taryn. I will definitely try that. I'm doing it again this summer, so I'm going to make them eat it out of the bag this time. Um, I did another mad science type program called Mad Scientist Mayhem. Um, we did elephant toothpaste, film canister rockets, even a simple baking soda and vinegar experiment, which seems very simple. I do that with my preschoolers um, just because it gets all fizzy and foamy and it's super cool. Um, but I had this age group really enjoy it too. They just love just like pouring it all together. We put it in soda bottles, just in open um, like lunch containers and things. And they just had a ton of fun playing around with it and touching it and seeing what the consistency was. Um, so hands-on stuff and things that can safely explode are very popular with this age group as well. Oh, back to the ice cream or the mad science or even slime. If you think you're going to have a large crowd, I recommend having a coworker help you or a volunteer if you can't spare another coworker. Because having extra hands to help you administer stuff or to help troubleshoot or pour ingredients or clean up even is extremely helpful. I've had to pull people in last minute into my program because I'll have too many people show up. It's just too much for me to handle on my own. Engineering, sticking on the science train, um, Rube Goldberg Night or Crazy Contraptions. If you don't know who Rube Goldberg is, look it up. Um, he has videos on YouTube. Um, this picture here is an example of one of the simple machines he makes. He's known for making things sort of like mousetrap, if any of you have ever played that. Um, where you know you put a bunch of things together and try and make a ball go around and knock things um, knock things over. Um, even if like putting up dominoes could work. It is very low budget. Um, some of the things that we do can get a little bit pricey for tweens because you have to you know buy things, have them come. This is something that was relatively a zero cost for us. Um, I brought in and had coworkers bring in their recycling items, paper towel tubes, boxes. Um, bottles, um, empty cans that you know are appropriate for the library, things like that. Um, really anything, string, yarn, tape, scissors. Um, I had ping pong balls left over from a program. Kids brought in books. And they built their very own simple Rube Goldberg machines. And they had a ton of fun with it. It was super cool to see them. They just automatically worked together, um, which I always love to see. I didn't have to force it. Um, some of the kids knew each other, but some of them didn't, and were just like, oh, what you're doing is really cool, and decided to just, like, work together, um, which I always love. Um, this, you know, stimulates their imagination. They really like having open building things. They have to follow so many instructions in school all the time. Having something where they can just come and do something fun, but maybe not have to listen to a thousand instructions and maybe be doing something, quote, unquote, wrong is really nice for them. Thank you for putting that um, link in there, Krista. Um, and then you can show videos for inspiration for the kids if they don't know um, who he is. Like I said, lots of them will know. It's a very popular thing, at least up here in my area. Um, for the kids, they, they know who he is. More science is coding. Yes, you can do it. Lots of us I know have um, Ozovat Spiros, um, little robots, things like that. If you can afford to have them, use them. If you can't afford them, that's okay. There are other things that we will talk about in a second for how you can bring coding into your tweens. Um, these things are very simple and easy to learn how to use. Pros of Ozovats and Spiros are that the kids really, really love them. It's like playing with a toy and they're learning while not knowing that they're learning. The biggest con to this that I have come into is that a lot of schools now have these items. So some of the kids are like, oh, we've used these at school. Like, I know what these are. Some of them still have fun. Some of them don't. Um, some of this will depend upon your demographic. I work in an area where some schools are very well funded and some schools are not so well funded. So I have some kids that, to them, the Ozobots and Zeros are boring, but I have other kids that have never seen them before. They only get to use them at the library because 
they can afford those things themselves, their school can't afford them. <clears throat> So it's, that's a good thing to do. Um, a way that I have helped it not be boring to the kids that have done it a lot is to come up with competitions. See who can make their Ozobot, you know, go around a path that we've created the best. Um, or we have little, um, you know, we have dash and dot. See who can take them through the book maze that you set up. And then you, we can even have prizes. I'll, a prize can even just be candy. I give candy a lot for prizes. I may give the winner like two pieces and then everyone else still gets one. Um, that way we don't have anyone unhappy. So that's a good motivator for the kids to get more involved and into it. If you can't afford those things, um, code.org is a really good resource. I went to a training with them. Um, you don't have to go to their training, but it's really, really cool. If you aren't familiar with this website, um, you should go. It has just lots of different little coding games for the kids. If you have a lab um, or laptop the kids could use, that's super great because then they can do it on their own. Um, but another thing I've done with this website is just show their games up on a projector and have us like talk through like what we should do or like take turns on moving the mouse ourselves or just have our two laptops set up. Kids can do that while other kids are doing something else. Um, and then we'll rotate around and take turns that way. If all of that stuff is too expensive, you don't have the room for it, any of that stuff, um, a much more budget-friendly thing to do with coding is crafty coding. Um, I have a lot of kids that really love crafts, and we sometimes don't do that as much with the older kids, and that's when they don't do as much art in school anymore either. Um, so I like to incorporate this into my programming if I can, um, and it sort of brings a new way to think about coding. I was that kid that was, I was into music and art and reading and all of that stuff. Science wasn't really my thing. But doing something like this would have related it to me in a better way. Coding is just patterns. That's all that it is. Um, we did things like graph paper coding, binary bracelets, spy decoders, which I will go over now. Crafty coding. Yes, it's a thing. Um, I did graph paper coding, which I found through code.org. I made these myself. I have links to all of this stuff in a Google Drive I'll give to you at the end. Um, I drew out by hand on a little graph emoji pictures. I have here my example of the heart emoji that I drew. I also did the sunglasses emoji. Um, I think just a smiley. And then, of course, the poop emoji. Because I know the demographic, they're going to think it's hilarious. So I made that one. And then I hand wrote out the instructions for them to start um, up in the top left-hand corner and they had to count the squares and then color in the ones with the colored dots under it. It was very time consuming for me, I'm not going to lie. I had to double and triple check. I kept making mistakes, I'm gonna have to rewrite it. But you might be able to find something like that online. I've also provided you the three or four that I made, so you can just take those and use them. I, that's why I put them in here, I don't care. Um, I would love for other people to use them. Um, we made binary bracelets, which I also got through code.org. Um, kids will write out a phrase, their initials, whatever they want in binary, which if you aren't familiar with binary, that's the language that's just like ones and zeros that computers use. Um, they use it here with just like black and white squares. And so I had the kids practice first with what they wanted. Um, it was easier to do initials because as you can see, each letter is eight things long. So if you have a name like Elizabeth, or my full name is Jillian, that would take forever. That would be like a super long necklace to make. Um, but I just used beads. They could color code it however they wanted. Um, just pick three colors, one to represent black, one to represent white, and then spacers. Um, and then they just put them on, a little bracelet or a necklace, um, just, you know, bead, string. I got little clasps from Michael so they could actually connect it onto their body without having to tie it. Um, the kids really loved that, too. And, you know, if they mess it up, who cares? It's still a cool-looking bead bracelet, and they can tell people that it's their initials, and no one is really going to know the difference. Um, and then DIY spy decoders. Just a basic cipher wheel, so if you're familiar with those, that's all that it is. Um, I found a template online, and then I <laughs> took that in and took out their letters because I didn't like the order it was in. I have attached to my personal copy of that as well. Um, I provided blank ones and ones with the alphabet handwritten in by me. Most of them chose the one with the alphabet already written in because 
then they didn't have to worry about it or worry about having each letter um, and all of that. Um, so just print it out on cardstock is what I recommend, so that way it's more durable and holds up better. Um, they can color it if they want to. Some of the kids got very into making it very colorful and putting their own little spin on it. Um, attach it with metal brads, and then they're good to go. Um, if you aren't familiar with how cipher wheels work, um, that's the thing where you say, like, A equals Q, and then um, you write out your code to where it'll just look like gibberish, and then they have to go through and, like, be like, oh, hey, well, if A equals Q, then, you know, match up all the letters and figure out um, the codes. They can send secret codes to each other. It's easier to explain to the kids if you can show them, I found. So I would for sure have an example, because um, I know I just did a terrible job of explaining how they work. Um, but it really is pretty simple once you take a look at it. Going out of science, book to movie club. Yes, book club can work. I attempted this last summer, and I was very nervous about it, because um, I had been told by coworkers here and a, you know, some people to friends from other systems and other libraries all across the country that book clubs with this age group, they just don't work. They don't come. The kids don't want to do it. Um, maybe some of you have had different experiences. But, you know, I figured I'm going to try it. You know, it's going to be a pretty much free program, worst case scenario. It's just my staff time, which is a pretty low prep pro program anyways. I would recommend, though, only attempting this if you know you have a following of at least a few kids that might come. Um, I mean, you wouldn't have to do that, but I found that half of the kids that came to my book movie club last summer were kids that just come to pretty much any program that I do because I built that relationship with them. Um, how I did this last summer, we met three times. We met early in June for summer reading where the kids got to pick the books themselves. Um, depending upon how you set it up, you could pre-pick the book, but I thought they would be more inclined to come if they chose them themselves. Um, so I gave them lists of books, I took their suggestions, and then we all voted on it. Um, I pulled some of our book discussion kits in advance and just books I thought might be popular. That way I could distribute copies the first, um, that first day, that first week. Um, when I distributed the books, I just wrote down the book number from the book club kit, took the child's name and their phone number, and just sent them off. Then we met again at the end of June. We watched the movie based on the book, and then we discussed it afterwards. Um, the discussion, honestly, was like 10 minutes because they don't want to sit there and talk about books. This is not cool. They wanted to come and see a movie, be like, oh, that was different, and then go home. Um, but we did talk about differences, similarities, um, the first book we did this past summer was Wonder, which um, I was really happy that the kids chose that. That movie does stick pretty closely, but it actually opened up some great discussion among us, which I thought was really cool. Um, if a child didn't read or finish the book, which I did have a few do, I still let them attend. I, do I want them to read the book? Of course. Do I really care? Eh, if they come to, you know, they're coming to the program, they're here at the library. Maybe they had other things going on and just couldn't read it. Not the end of my world. Um, at the first meeting, we collected it and then gave out the second book that they had chose, which was Holes. Um, and I thought that was exciting, too. That's a slightly older book. Um, any books not collected by the end of the summer, I only had, like, one child not return a book. And I gave them a few weeks, called their mom, and they were like, oh, my gosh, and brought it back. I didn't have a problem with that. Um, that's something to consider, though, if you're going to do this, is that if you don't get the books back, how will you handle that? Will you just take it as a loss for the library? Will you charge the child? Um, you can have them check them out on their cards if you would like. I chose to not do that because I wasn't sure if every child would have a library card with them. Maybe they're in a status where they maybe they have too many fines and can't check out a book. Um, and I didn't want to make it so a child couldn't attend solely because of a reason like that. So I decided to just use our book discussion kits, and I was just kind of hoping for the best, to be honest. Um, and the best happened. I got everything back. Um, the kids told me they would keep coming in October and in the fall. Um, 
and I had a feeling they were lying to me, and they were. Um, I tried this again in October and December. Um, in October, I did James and the Giant Peach, and no one came, which is what I had a feeling would happen, but that because October is busy, I totally got it. It was okay. I just picked up my stuff and just went back to work. Um, in December, I did How the Grinch Stole Christmas, since it's a shorter book and kids are busy that time of year with school, um, and then it's, it's a holiday-themed movie. Um, I only had two or three kids come to that one, so I decided to just only do this during the summer. Um, I'm trying it again, so hopefully I have a good turnout once again in the summer. If I don't, then I'll probably reevaluate. Um, so for the summer, I'd recommend trying it. If you haven't planned your summer programs yet, think about popping one in. Um, you don't have to meet before. You could pre-select the book in the movie. Um, you could make it a family book to movie club. Um, I made this for ages 9 to 12 last summer. Um, that way the reading levels would all be around the same. And that way just the maturity level of the kids would be the same and we wouldn't have any really, really little ones trying to come. Um, I told parents that they could come in if they wanted to, but it really wasn't you know, like a family book discussion, but obviously parents are always welcome to sit in. Most of them choose to not because they're taking it as a break to go do their own thing. Um, provide snacks, though. Always provide snacks. I would make popcorn for the movies. I'd have candy. Um, just, you know, make it fun. I'd have drinks. I'd have water and um, Gatorade and things like that. Another thing to remember, I've said this several times, this is not school. It's just meant to be fun. If they read it, great. If they didn't, great. If they talk about the book, fantastic. If they don't, it's okay. Um, you know, I would try my best to facilitate discussions ahead of time. Um, you know, but sometimes it's just not going to work. I had a pretty chatty group, so it did happen to work well for me, but sometimes these kids, if they don't know each other, they're like adults, like Think about how many of us are in a room full of people we don't know and maybe don't want to speak up about something because we feel awkward and uncomfortable. And this age group are at the height of that. They don't want to look um, dumb. They don't want someone else to think that, you know, they asked something silly or that they said something weird. And so that's just something to consider. And I try my best to just sort of be fun and goofy with them and show them it's okay. Like anything you say is okay. Um, but it's still still difficult to navigate, I know. All right. Moving on from book to movie club are artful afternoons, going back to those crafts and art programs that this age group seems to really enjoy. Um, this was a series of programs I did last summer. I did it um, every other Thursday in June and July. Um, last summer, we did DIY Sharpie mugs, mosaics, canvas art, and then crafts in the movie. Um, I had a lot of kids come to these. Um, I did them in, just in the afternoons during the week, and I had anywhere um, except for canvas arts, but I had 10 to 15 kids come to most of them, which for a daytime program for this age group during the summer is a pretty good turnout here at my branch. Um, for the Sharpie mugs, just get mugs from Dollar Tree. They're only a dollar. Uh, I think I ordered them in bulk, and I got, like, 20 of them, I think, and I had one or two that were slightly defective, um, but otherwise, super cheap, super easy. Um, you just get paint pens. I ordered them from Amazon, super cheap. Kids can draw on them. Um, I sent them home with instructions, print it out, that way mom and dad can see it. Um, you just let it dry, bake it to set, and then it's pretty good to go. I made one myself with the kids, and mine, I noticed, even though I told them to hand wash it, the paint did start to chip off even after hand washing this a couple of times. So these maybe aren't long-lasting mugs, but it's still something fun for them to do, and it's still something that they can take home and use, and they could, you know, redraw on it themselves with just a regular Sharpie if they feel the need to. Um, and worst case, you know, it's a Dollar Tree mug. They use it a few times, and then it breaks, or they don't use it, and whatever. Um, mosaic. So for this, I just bought some wooden picture frames from Michaels for a dollar, and I painted the base white um, just because I personally wanted it to be that color. Um, I ordered a bunch of mosaic tiles off of Amazon. 
but you can improvise. You can use sequins, um, you know, little jewels. I've seen mosaics done with just like construction paper cut up, where it's more like a paper mache type thing almost. Um, you know, you could use tissue paper. Use whatever you have on hand, whatever your budget allows for. Um, you will need more than you think if you buy the actual tiles, because it seemed like I was getting a lot, but covering an entire picture frame uses a lot of mosaic tiles. Um, I was dumb and at first bought like actual mosaic glue and like the grout, and then I was reading the instructions once I got it, and I was like, this is going to be way too hard, and the glue said you needed to be in a well-ventilated area and to maybe wear like a mask, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm using this between, like I can't do this, like what am I going to do? Tacky glue worked fine. The tiles stuck to the wooden picture frames. Um, if you were wanting to stick it to a different type of surface, I don't know if the tacky glue would have held. Um, so if you're going to do this, I would recommend testing it or looking into what adhesive you might need for your surface. Um, a glue gun would maybe work. Um, but make sure to test that out and not make my same mistake. Canvas art is also very popular. I've done this as um, standalone programs as well just throughout the year. Canvas art programs are very expensive. Um, so depending upon your budget, you could maybe improvise and you can get um, canvas boards that are a lot cheaper. Um, you know, maybe just watercolor painting on cardstock or, you know, painting on cardstock or, you know, something like that um, could help it be a little bit more affordable. What I do is I bulk buy the canvases at Michael's you get 40 for $40, which is a chunk of money, but that's still only a dollar per canvas, which is much cheaper than buying it any other way. Um, I just give them 8 by 10 canvases um, because I'm buying so many. It gets more expensive the larger you get. I use acrylic paint because it dries fast. It's easy to paint over. You can wipe it off and then just paint over it if you need to if the kid messes up. I have never led them through something specific anytime I do this. Um, some kids will show up and think it's going to be like one of those like paint classes you can go to, um, you know, paint and wine or, you know, things like that that adults go to. No, I am not an artist. I don't have a ton of artistic ability when it comes to like painting and drawing and stuff. I just let them do whatever they would like and they always impress me. It always looks so good, um, you know, just like I said, the acrylic paints. I brought in hair dryers to use on it to make it um, faster drying for them, especially some kids will glob the paint on there in very large quantities. Um, you know, fill out cups of water, give them a few different sizes of paintbrushes. I put a picture in here. Um, as you can see, I covered the tables. Plastic tablecloths are like my best friend for my tween program because then I could just pick them up and throw them away after they were covered in paint. Um, I've also in the past, if there's not a ton of paint on there, I'll let it dry and then fold it up and use it again. Um, we have little easels that I pulled out um, that we could use, but I've done it before um, where they're just like on the tables as well. Um, ooh, a Bob Ross paint party. Yes, we did that with some adults here and it was super fun. So I think something like that um, could go over really well too. I've seen um, tutorials on YouTube and stuff even where you can um, you, know, you could show one of those and the kids could make whatever that person's making. Um, but I, I tend to find that with a lot of, at least for my kids, these programs, I'll show them an example or be like, here's what you're meant to do, and they just do their own thing anyways. Um, but, you know, whatever you think your kids might like or some kids might like the option, they can do that as well. And then for crafts in a movie, that was just sort of a chill laid-back program. I like to just give the kids a space that they can hang out similar to like a teen space type program, but just for their specific age group, which is what this was. I brought in the leftovers from the mosaics um, and the Sharpie mugs. I had scratch art, um, pencil pouches with designs on them they could color. I set out some coloring pages, just some simple things like that. And then they voted on a movie and we just crafted while we watched a movie. Um, they actually chose the original Jumanji, which I was very excited about because I love that movie. Um, but, you know, I gave them things that are towards their age group that some of them are more, you know, current or some classics like the Sandlot or, like I said, they chose the Jumanji from the 90s, which was pretty cool to me. All right. Miscellaneous. Miscellaneous fun stuff. 
tie-dye. Tie-dye is once again one of those programs that is going to see a giant mess. This is one that I highly recommend requiring registration if you don't typically do that solely because if you're doing t-shirts, you'll need to know their sizes. Um, you can also do tie-dye socks, um, but that's maybe not as appealing to the kids. It might be, it might not be. Um, I've only done t-shirts personally. Um, I buy them in quantities from Walmart. I, I see whatever's cheaper, Hanes, Fruit of the Loom, um, whatever other brands they have, and just buy like the biggest pack that I can get. Um, so this is an expensive program. And then I buy the Tulip One Step Dye Kit, where you just wet the, wet the shirt in water, and then you just dye it that way. You don't have to use hot water or pre-wash or anything like that. Um, now, you will have to warn the kids that the dye will stain their clothes. They should know this, but I have still had kids just shocked that the white T-shirt that they're wearing with their, like, soccer team logo on it is going to get stained by the dye. They just won't think about it. The parents don't always think about it, which kind of, it shouldn't baffle me, but it does. Um, so do warn them of that. Know some of the twisting techniques yourself. Um, I know how to make horizontal and vertical and diagonal stripes, and I know how to do the spiral, and I'll show them how to do it and how to rubber band their shirts. Um, especially for the spiral, some of the kids will struggle doing it on their own, so I will wrap it for them. Um, cover your tables once again for this, or go outside. Um, I've done this in the summer a few times, and the weather has just never cooperated with me to go outside. It's always pouring down rain every time I do tie-dye. So what I do to cover the tables is I put down two layers of paper that we use to just normal craft paper that we use to cover our tables at my system. And then I use my trusty plastic tablecloth, once again, um, to put on top of it. That way, you know, if the plastic tablecloth moves or rips, the, water, the paper will absorb it. You could use newspaper as well. Um, you know, use the old ones that you're going to get rid of from your collection if you, you know, keep newspapers. Just that way, it won't get all over the place. Um, so I, yeah, I highly recommend doing that. Getting a large bin that you can put the water in to wet the shirts first or having a sink nearby is helpful as well. Another miscellaneous fun thing is a pizza party. Who doesn't love pizza? It's a great way to get the kids in. Um, it's a super chill program, similar to, like I said, just a teen space type thing. I order a couple of pizzas usually. Um, I bring out board games. I always have coloring pages. Um, I'll occasionally have popsicles or candy at the end. Um, especially if it's in the summer, I'll bring out like maybe little things of like ice cream or something. Um, and the kids seem to have a lot of fun with this. This is one that if they know each other ahead of time, they'll hang out together. But I've seen kids, you know, join in with each other playing different games. And it's very low-key and relaxed. If they're not having a good time, they can just have a couple, couple pieces of pizza and then leave. I try to discourage it, and I try to walk around and talk to all the kids, get to know them. Um, I, I've sat down and played games with them before, or at least, like, popped in a little bit. Um, and then in addition to this, I'll do board game nights. I won't have pizza. I'll occasionally pull out some sort of snacks, maybe like chips or candy or something. Um, this is very self-explanatory. Just get out some popular games, let the kids play with each other. Um, I have some kids have their parents come in with them, so that way if they don't have another kid to play with, their mom or dad will. Uh, popular games for my kids are Jenga. Jenga is very popular. Um, you can even make like giant Jenga out of you um, 12 pack. Um, empty 12-pack boxes, you can do that. Um, Monopoly is actually very popular. Connect Four, Trouble, Uno, um, Checkers, lots of things like that are pretty popular among the kids. Those are the ones that are always taken off my table. Um, Sorry is another one that's very popular and that the kids just seem to really, really love. More miscellaneous fun stuff, fandom nights. Knowing specific pop culture type things that your kids are into will always make for good programs. Harry Potter, we all know Harry Potter. I'm sure we've all done Harry Potter programs in our system. Doing one that's just for this specific age group, though, you can make it a little bit more special. Um, we have found in the past that some of our Harry Potter programs, we have some that will market just for the teens, and then we'll have family ones where, once again, then you just have a lot of kindergartners, first graders there that this age group 
they don't want to be around the kids that are that young. Um, and then you can do things that are a little bit more difficult. You don't have to worry about, is this craft going to be too hard for that five-year-old that comes? So you can just be like, nope, it's targeted towards this age group and make it targeted towards them. Um, you can do things like making wands, of course, get sorted. Um, I like to do like quiz trivia competitions type things. Um, how I often run these is that I know not every kid will want to participate. So I'll have the papers. I'll tell them about it at the beginning of the program. During their downtime between other activities, they can fill it out. And then I'll, you know, do like last calls. Like if you're, you know, wanting to do trivia, turn it in. Um, and then I'll go through and grade them. And then for the winners, I, for my last Harry Potter program, I gave them a little pop um, Harry Potter keychain which they thought was super cool. It actually made them really, really want to participate. And I made it pretty hard, too, because these kids probably are going to know a lot. Um, we did a golden snitch craft at one of my most recent Harry Potter nights. Uh, we took ping pong balls, wrapped them in gold foil, and then hot glued on white feathers. So the good thing about this age group is they can use glue guns. You have to supervise them slightly, but they still have probably used them before. They know how they work. They are they understand that it is hot, and that if they touch it, they might burn themselves. Um, you can have themed snacks, all that stuff, of course. We all know how to do Harry Potter programs. Um, superheroes, we've possibly all done those programs in the past as well. Um, I did one of those recently, and we made capes and masks. Um, they could decorate them with their own design. I also pre-printed logos, um, like Batman and Wonder Woman and Captain America, um, you know, the Hulk, all that stuff. I did trivia the same way I did for Harry Potter. Um, I had a pop keychain of Wonder Woman for this one, which once again really enticed them to participate. Um, Super Smacks. Um, I've done a game called Hulk Smash, which is where I've had Play-Doh out and the kids have to like smash it down and they, they think that's super fun because they just get to like bang on the table for a few minutes. Um, I've also seen it done where you can buy like the Hulk gloves that the kids put on, and then they can smash, like, ice cream cones or crackers or something like that. Um, but we don't have um, those here at my system. Yes, for the capes, I, was not, I realized I didn't tell you how I made them. I made them out of my good old friend's plastic tablecloths. Um, I ordered some rolls off of Amazon and folded them up, and I found a template online. Um, but you can just sort of, you know, cut out, like, a like a flat-topped triangle almost. So I folded the tablecloth in half and just cut out, you know, a triangle that way with a flat top on it. And then they were able to put it on. I gave them elastic string to, we taped it on the capes, which you had to really, really tape it on. Uh, but that way they could connect it. Uh, you could probably use yarn or something as well. Um, you could use fabric, but that would be much more expensive, and I figured that these would be worn a few times, and then if they really loved it, they could make one again, um, or maybe buy one or have mom or dad help them make one out of something they already have. Um, you could make them out of maybe old t-shirts and things as well, if that was something that you had, um, but I, I just used plastic tablecloths, nice and simple. Oh, see, up there you go, out of the backs of extra, extra, extra large t-shirts. So there's lots of different ways. Google. Google is like my best friend for most of this stuff. I'm sure we all Google and use Pinterest for most of our programming ideas. Um, so continue, you know, just search for that. Reach out to fellow librarians. We can all share our, our ideas with you. Now, if you build it, will they come? This is the hardest part. I know we've all planned awesome tween programs before to have no one show up. How do you get them there? I shamelessly self-promote. Do you go out to the schools at all for outreach? Talk it up. Bring flyers. Um, have the teen librarian tell you know her middle schoolers or your middle schoolers or anything like that. Um, post flyers around your library. I promote it sometimes in my other programs or have um, you know the adult people promote it to their adults. You know they have kids, grandkids. I do a story time on Friday mornings, but. Lots of those parents and caregivers have older kids as well that might be in this demographic or might have a friend that has a child in your correct age. So just tell it to everyone. Make your coworkers promote it. Kind of just annoy people to death with it. Um, if you use social media at all to promote your program, push it out on Facebook and on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, I find that for this age group, a lot of these kids, they're not following the library. They don't care what we're doing. 
Um, so Facebook tends to be how my system reaches most adults in that age range for the parents of these kids. So I tend to promote a lot of my stuff on Facebook, but whatever works best for your system, um, do that. You could maybe just drop off some flyers at a local school. Like maybe you don't actually go there. Just take some flyers to them. If you have teacher contacts, let them know. Shamelessly self-promote. Food. Much like the teens, food will bring them in. Snacks will always win. Feed them. They will be there. Like I said, Pizza Party always has a ton of kids come, and then I tell them all about my other programs, and then I'll see some of them continually coming. Um, do a lot of really big, super fun stuff early on to help you gain a following of kids that will come. Um, things like pizza party, tie-dye, slime, um, painting even, you know, canvas painting, um, a Harry Potter party. Things that you know will probably bring a lot of kids in, and then you can do that shameless, like, self-promote, almost force it on them, make sure they know about it. I always have flyers out for them to take home, um, all that stuff. And just know your community, know your demographic. Um, you know, this demographic has some overarching similarities and that they're interested in sort of pop culture things, maybe science, maybe art. They like being hands-on. Um, but, like, maybe, like, Pokemon's super popular where you live. Do a Pokemon program just for this age group. Are Painted Rocks big? Do that. You know, Fortnite. Um, do Go Noodle. You know, do something like that. Something that you specifically know your kids are into. And then they might bring their friends with them, and then their friends will keep coming back as well. Um, I've seen that happen in some of my programs, so hopefully you can see it too. Now, how to keep them coming. Um, it can be really hard to keep up with this. Um, the best thing to do is to keep up with current trends within this age group. The easiest way to do this is to just talk to them. Um, at programs, I'll sit down and I'll talk to the kids. I'll ask them what they're into, you know, what new things going on. I'm just, I have a natural interest in a lot of this stuff, which is very helpful if you are naturally interested in pop culture. It will probably be a big help because you'll be able to talk to the kids about their interests. Um, like, I'm super interested in superheroes and Harry Potter and Disney. Um, and I'm not a big gamer, but I know enough about the video game community that I can sort of keep up with that as well. Maybe you're not into it. That's fine. Google it. Find a coworker who's into it. Learn at least enough that you can talk to the kids or just know what might be popular, um, you know, to help serve them for things that they would like to see. I've done surveys. Do they want to fill out a survey? No. But I'll just set it out. I'll let them know. I, you know, I'll have it at a pizza party. They're like, hey, if you would fill this out, I want to do things that you want to come to. So please let me know. I just make it a few questions. I'll ask them what their favorite was from, like, maybe the past session. Ask them what they would like to do, um, things like that. I've gotten some really good feedback. A lot of the kids actually do fill it out because, there are things that they want to do, too, that maybe you haven't thought of yet, so they want to let you know. Um, you can also do this verbally. Like I said, you can just talk to them, especially if you have a smaller crowd coming. Just talk to them. I know we only have a little bit of time left, so hopefully we can get through it all. What not to do? I've said this before. We are not school. Um, a big thing I've encountered with this is when they're forced to work together. Maybe you want them to work in groups but maybe they don't know anyone else there and don't want to be forced to work with a kid they don't know. I've only forced it when it's absolutely necessary for the activity, and it's usually something very fast. Um, I did a mummy wrapping game with toilet paper at a Halloween party. I made the kids be in groups of, like, five for that, but it lasted one minute, and then they could go sit down and not talk to each other, and that was fine. Um, don't treat them like little kids. This should seem very obvious, but this age group, is craving that independence. Can they have it? Of course not. They're 11. They don't know what they want. But they are people too. Treat them like people. It's very similar to working with teens. Like, just talk to them like you would any other person within the library. Um, we don't have to baby them. You know, um, if they do something to warrant it, I've had to turn on my stern mom teacher voice. I've had kids throw slime so high in the air it gets stuck on the ceiling. I've had to get pretty stern with that. Um, but working with tweens is very similar to working with 
teens in the aspect of you just sort of, you know, be a little bit more hands off unless you can see that you need to get in there. Um, you know, they're, they're craving that independence. They want, they're testing the boundaries. They want them, but they are going to push your boundaries a little bit. And don't make them be too quiet, especially in a designated program space where they can be loud. They've had to sit in school and be quiet all day. Like, they don't want to sit down and listen to a thousand instructions and be told to be quiet and just be nice little neat, perfect little angels. My kids usually end up running around the room at the end, sort of like screaming, where I just, I'll let it happen for a couple minutes and I'll be like, all right, guys, like, let's just not run, like, we're inside, and sort of calm them down that way. What to do? Joke around with them. Get to know them really well. You can tease kids this age group, not in a mean way, um, but they understand sarcasm. You know, I'll have kids be like, oh, are we painting today when there's, like, clearly paint out on the tables? And I'll be like, nope, we're sure not painting today. I don't know why all the paint is out. And they love when you do stuff like that with them. It's super fun for them. They feel like they're being treated like an adult, um, which I know they really love and appreciate about my interactions with them. If the parents come, I talk to the parents, too. If you get to know them and create that good rapport with them, they'll keep coming back and they'll spread the word to their other friends. I play music. I have a go-to Disney playlist I play because it's library appropriate. Um, like I said, let them push your boundaries. Be real. Just have fun. They can tell if you're enjoying your time with them. Um, if you're not having fun, they'll, they'll know and then they'll just stop coming. Um, another thing I didn't put on here is learn their names. I give them um, sticker name tags every week to write their name on. Um, that way I can look and see what it is. And then they'll regularly start coming, and you'll just get to know them. And they love it when you remember their name. Just like you like it when people remember yours or a preschooler likes it, this age group really likes it as well. I put all of my resources into a Google Drive, which I've given you the link here. Um, I had some people test it, so it should work. Um, but I put instructions like Rube Goldberg, Elephant Toothpaste, um, the graph paper coding, all of that stuff is in there. So feel free to take a look at that. Um, if you have any questions, of course, reach out to me and all of that. Finally, enjoy this awkward bathroom mirror selfie I took um, back in September when I was at the ALSC Institute. Um, if you see me out somewhere, come up and say hi. I go to um, you know KDLA events. I'm going to ALA in June, so if anyone else is going, I don't know why we would maybe run into each other, but maybe we would. Um, come up and say hi. I go to Swan events, all that stuff. My email is on this page. Feel free to email me if you have any further questions. Um, and I think that is about it. Do you guys have any questions for me? I know that was a lot of information that I threw at you all at once. So. All right. Thank you so much, Jill, for this action-packed hour. Um, Jill and I will stay on the line for a few more minutes to take any uh, final questions, comments, anything anybody would like to share. Um, we will go ahead and move into our wrap-up and further resources. Just a reminder that today's webinar and all training provided by KDLA is made possible in part by the Institute for Museum and Library Services. If you would like for us to continue to provide quality continuing education, please take a few seconds before leaving today's training to complete a quick survey that is located at the bottom of your screen to the left of the chat pod. Whether you're looking for just general great ideas uh, for summer, or anytime, check our summer reading support website. Or stay in touch through the Kayak Lister. Kayak is a discussion list devoted to those who work with children and teens in the library. It stands for Kentucky Young Adults and Children. To join the list, simply send an email with the subject Kayak to my email address, and then the body of the message lists your name, in the name of your library. You can always follow KDLA's Continuing Education Department on social media. We're on Facebook at KDLA 
CE or on Twitter at KDLA Lib Dev, which stands for Library Development. The Kayak Weekly Digest comes out every Friday. It compiles updates on training opportunities, grant funding, awards, as well as tips and trends in library world. You can find past editions of the Digest on KDLA's Youth Services website, as well as announcements about statewide training opportunities in all of KDLA's Youth Appropriate Book Discussion and Thematic Programming Kits. A reminder that you can find more upcoming webinars on KDLA's continuing education calendar and make sure to check back to the archived webinars page for today's recording as well as many other great children's and teen topics. I want to thank Jill Frazier with the Kenton County Public Library for today's great webinar, Reading Between the Lines, How to Reach and Serve the Tweens in Your Library. A reminder that everybody who has attended today's live webinar will receive a certificate of attendance. Slides are now available for download in the bottom left-hand part of the screen and will be available again with the recording that will be posted within one week of today's date. If you are listening to the archive, we too would like your feedback and you can complete the link to the IMLS survey at the bottom of the screen. Again, this has been Krista King-Oaks with the KDLA, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.